<laughs> All right, so um, we are in the middle of functional groups. We've already talked about hydroxyl groups, carbonyl groups, carboxyl groups. And we left off with the amino group. So the amino group is going to be a nitrogen containing group. Um, you can see it's nitrogen associated with two amino acids. We're going to find out that it actually has ionized and non ionized form. When the amino group is attached to a carbon skeleton, those carbon skeletons are going to be called amines. This is the non ionized, which you should have collected that already because it has no charge, right? So can't be ionized. So that's our non ionized form. When we are in the ionized form, in the ionized form, an amine, amino group is going to readily pick up a proton. And actually, in biological systems, it's going to be readily found in the ionized form. And so that ionized form is just simply going to be NH3 plus. NH2 there, NH3 plus. This proton readily picks up a proton. Okay, so if it readily picks up a proton, What's it going to do to the pH of the solution? Is it more acidic? What's happening to the concentration of hydrogen? Because it's picked up. So concentration decreases, which means pH increases. So it's actually going to always continue to alkaline, uh, cause the, the solution to become more and more alkaline. So it's acting as a base. What's that word? Readily. Readily. Come on, it's not that. It's really it really picks up protons. <laughs> the sulfhydryl group here, you can see it contains sulfur. We commonly see the sulfhydryl group associated with the amino acid cysteine, which is commonly incorporated into uh, proteins to help stabilize final conformation structure of those proteins. Those molecules that are associated with the sulfhydryl group, <clears throat> that carbon skeleton will be a thiol. Now, what's not shown here, I told you uh, on Wednesday that there were six functional groups I wanted you to be aware of. The one that's not shown on here is that group right there. It's called a phosphate group. And the phosphate group, R is the rest of the molecule, the phosphorus with the four oxygens and the two hydrogens is the actual group. That phosphate group is an anion. Association with phosphoric acid. And then that dissociated <laughs> phospho uh, phosphate from the phosphoric acid, the phosphate ion that's produced. Bonded to oxygen on a carbon skeleton. <coughs> and the reason that this is so important for biology is because we see three phosphate groups associated with adenine to form adenine triphosphate. Medicine triphosphate is an extremely important molecule in the production 
uh, of energy that we can use inside of the cell. That bond right there, we'll talk a lot about as we go through the rest of the semester, because that bond is a very high energy bond. If we can break that bond, we can release enough energy that we can do a lot of different work inside of the cell. Um, just like all the others, a um, carbon skeleton associated with phosphate is, is simply going to be organic phosphate. Okay, so. What I've got to set the stage is that not only is water really important for biological systems, carbon is very important for biological systems. Four balance electrons, four balance electrons that help to create massive amounts of structural diversity. And there are four types of molecules we're going to call macromolecules that become critically important for biology. We're going to be carbohydrates, also called saccharides, amino acids slash proteins. Amino acids is the building block for proteins and polypeptides. Um, nucleic acids, which we find in DNA and RNA, and then lipids, which we're going to find associated with membranes, uh, plasma membranes in the cell and surrounding cells. The cell membrane. Mitochondrial membranes, both mitochondrial membranes, both the complex and the plasma reticulum, etc. So you can go ahead and begin a nice brand new lecture. If you want to name it something, we can call it carbohydrates and lipids. We're going to begin this discussion on our natural molecules. And we'll eventually get to your carbohydrates and lipids that we can set some of the basic generalizations that we need to be aware of. Okay, so that term macromolecule, it just simply is a molecule or molecules that have many atoms. So sodium chloride, NaCl, has two atoms, it's not a macromolecule. But Alanine, one of our amino acids, you can see that it has numerous atoms associated with it. So we're going to call that a macromolecule. The major macromolecules, again, that we need to know about are saccharides, which you probably know better as carbohydrate CHO, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So each of these molecules here, made up of a variety of different atoms, are based off of carbon chemistry, organic chemistry, and the polymonocular solutions that we're talking about in the biological system. Eventually, what we're going to do is we're going to begin to take these macromolecules of saccharides, lipids, carbon proteins, and nucleic acids, and begin to build what are called organelles and membranes, and extract everything together and we'll build in cells. When we're dealing with macromolecules, they typically come in uh, up to two different forms, or maybe even a little bit more um, if we're looking at some of the sugars. But they, they usually are found in, in this thing called a polymer. So this applies to pretty much every macromolecule, with the exception, really, of our lipids. A polymer is any material that's made up of individual building blocks. They're all strapped together. In other words, polymers are just chains of molecules. And we find polymers of saccharides, proteins, and nucleic acids. DNA, the DNA molecule is a polymer. Messenger RNA molecules are polymers. Glycogen, which is made up of individual glucose molecules, glycogen is a polymer. Starch. What you eat from potatoes is a bunch of glucose molecules all strapped together as a polymer. The subunit of the chain of molecules, polymer, the subunit of the polymer is called a monomer. Monomers are going to be the individual building blocks. So just like the outside of this building has bricks on it, the individual brick would be like the monomer. The wall that the brick is made out of would be like the polymer. 
to take our individual monomers and to get them into that chain-like structure, we use covalent bonds, or what I'm going to call covalent linkages. And I'm calling them covalent linkages because within the individual monomer, such as this monomer of alanine, which is an amino acid that will make up protein, all of those atoms are held together by sharing their electrons and covalent bonds. And then it might take individual amino acids, and I begin to strap them together, alanine, valanine, serine, valine, alanine. I'm linking the two monomers together. It's a covalent bond, but it's linking the two molecules together. So it's a covalent linkage. It's just a description of that covalent bond between individual monomers. Okay? So I have to synthesize those covalent linkages. Now I want you really to apply what you've learned so far this semester, because I've given you the groundwork to do this. In the synthesis process, I'm going to take two monomers, maybe it's two individual amino acids, or it could be two molecules of glucose, or it could be two individual nucleotides, Take those two monomers, and i got to link them together. Okay, so I've got to produce that covalent linkage. When I do that, I have a molecule of water, H2O, that's lost from the chain. So as I link them together, water comes out. What kind of reaction am I talking about? I'm losing water. What happens when you lose water? Dehydrate. Yes, dehydrate. So it's a dehydration synthesis reaction. Because of geniuses. Okay, so we're going to use dehydration reactions to put together these linkages. So notice, here I am dehydrate, using a dehydration synthesis to produce a molecule called moto, maltose. Down here, dehydration synthesis uh, to produce a molecule called sucrose. So I take two individual glucose molecules together. Here's my water. It's not water yet. We're going to pull that water out as we take and combine the oxygen from one molecule to the carbon bind up the oxygen to the carbon on the other molecule. Water comes out, dehydration is changed, so it's a dehydration reaction or synthesis reaction. Now, in order to do this, it shouldn't surprise you that I'm going to need an enzyme, right? Because if I want to have a chemical reaction occur at normal body temperature, I have to get over that hump called the activation of energy, or energy of activation. And so I'm going to use the enzyme to do that. I'm going to use the enzyme to facilitate that reduction in the amount of energy that's needed for that reaction to occur spontaneously. And it's also going to require energy. So enzyme, put it together, and also requires energy. So it's as simple as that, right? As simple as it's just a dehydration reaction in the presence of energy and an enzyme to facilitate the process to begin to build a polymer. Well, we also probably want to be able to break our polymers apart, right? If I store a bunch of glucose in a molecule called glycogen, if I need that glucose, it'd be good if I could pull it back out of the out of the polymer. So we can also disassemble. When it is disassembled, again, uh, rubber meets the road here, <coughs> that linkage needs to be broken. To go from being incorporated in the chain to being an individual monomer. I'll give you a hint. I'm going to use water to do this as well. I'm going to put water back in. So what kind of reaction would it be? 
It's not oil hydration. I'm using water to break the molecule. It's a hydrolysis reaction. What's that? <laughs> so you got a dehydration synthesis reaction to put it together. You have a hydrolysis reaction to break it apart. Water comes out. Water goes back in. Literally hydrolysis, and I know I've already mentioned this, literally that just means to break with water, right? Lysis is to break, and hydro is referencing the water, so we're literally using water to break the bond. This is still going to require an enzyme. However, in this case, rather than using energy, we're going to release a little bit of energy. Right? Because when we made it, we put energy in. Now we're breaking it, we get a little bit of energy back out. Some of it's going to be lost to heat, but some of it could actually be somewhat usable. So when we break those covalent bonds, that's when we actually release a little bit of heat. When we make them, we're taking heat in. We're using the energy. So I need the enzyme. I don't really need ATP here, but I'm going to also need water. So to go in the reverse direction, I'm going to need that water in the presence of the enzyme to cause the reaction to happen. All right, so there's kind of the groundwork. We know how to make and break these molecules. We know the basic anatomical terminology, polysaccharide or poly polymers and monomers. Now let's specify this. Become more specific. We're going to start with saccharides. So the saccharides are going to be sugars, and they're sugar polymers. When I have just an individual molecule of sugar, such as that molecule of glucose or that molecule of fructose, those simple sugars are monomers, specifically they're going to be monosaccharides. So I'm taking out the mer and I'm putting in a specific molecule to get the new, the new name. So monosaccharides. Um, in other words, the monosaccharide is going to be the monomer language for carbohydrates. I can use individual monosaccharides, put them together through dehydration synthesis to build polymers. If I put them together, such as what I've done here, these are my monosaccharides. Right? All four of these are monosaccharides. I put them together, and I now have two individual saccharides together. When I have those two saccharides together, so two monosaccharides, I now have what's called a disaccharide. And you actually deal with disaccharides all over the time. A glucose and fructose molecule make up a disaccharide called sucrose. Sucrose is what you find on the table in the morning for your breakfast. That's simple table sugar. Does everybody have that? Yeah. Taking it a step further, if I take many individual monitors and begin to string them together. So in this case, many monosaccharides. This is where I get my polymer. And in carbohydrate, in terms of carbohydrates, I'm going to have polysaccharides. Okay, so monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Then I also probably want to give it a little bit 
more of a chemistry emphasis. And we can define our molecular formula in general terms for carbohydrates, i.e. saccharides. The molecular formula for saccharides, all of them are going to follow a C, H2, O, to the N formula. The N is the number of carbons that are going to be present. So in other words, glucose has six carbons, so that molecular formula for glucose is altered to C6, H12, O6. In addition to just its general molecular formula, each molecule of sugar is going to have a hydroxyl functional group on each carbon except for one. And I'm going to call that one carbon. I'm just going to refer to it as the alcohol. All of the others are going to have the OH. By the way, what does that make? Saccharides? One molecule based off of the presence of the functional group. It's a hydroxide, but what do we call hydroxides? Can you figure it out yet? Alcohols. That alcohol carbon is going to be associated with an oxygen. That oxygen and carbon are going to look like that. You want to remember that functional group. Y'all are good. You don't. If you're a biologist, you never leave chemistry. You never leave physics either. Biology is chemistry and physics is the whole system. Okay, so it's a carbonyl group. What's that? So what am I doing? Becoming a. So that carbonyl group becomes really important, that oddball uh, carbon, it can actually occur anywhere within that chain of carbons, but anywhere within that skeleton we're going to have that carbonyl group show up. So based off of the carbonyl location, so here my carbonyl group is at the end, here it's associated with carbon number two, so carbon one here, carbon number two here. So I'm basically saying that the carbonyl group can either occur at the end of the molecule or within the molecule. Directly referencing saccharides when the carbonyl group is on an outer carbon, such as carbon number one. Notice that we call that an L dose. And the OSE. ASC, anyone remember what ASC references? Enzymes. OSC is going to reference saccharides. So if you run into a molecule that's OSC, amylose, which by the way is the proper name for starch, amylose we know is a type of a sugar. L-dose, when that carbonyl group is in an aldehyde position, so L-dose, Aldehyde is referring to the carbonyl group at the end of the molecule. Whereas with the inner carbon, it's a ketose. You remember that the inner carbon, when there's a carbonyl group, is a ketone. So if it's a sugar, we call it a ketose. So glucose, because the carbonyl group is out here at the end of the molecule, it's an aldose molecule. Fructose is a ketose because the carbonyl is associated with one of the inner carbons. 
just so that we're all on the same page and you have it on your notes, whenever you see OSE, you know that that is a or a saccharide. Uh, another way that we can differentiate these molecules, remember it's carbon, right? It's, it's helping us to build different types of structures. We can increase or decrease the number of carbons in the molecule. <laughs> So we can change the length of the carbon skeleton by adding or removing carbons from the molecule. So here are a bunch of different sugars. And you can see that we start up here and we just have three carbons in the molecule. And then as we progress down here towards the bottom to our hexoses, we have six. Now notice that. I'm adding additional designators in the word. These are all L doses, meaning the carbonyl group is on the very end of the molecule, associated in this case, in every case here, with carbon one. It's also a hexose. So it's an L-do hexose because it's a carbonyl group at the end plus a total of six carbons. So just based off of the name, I can gain a lot of knowledge about what the molecule is. So we have different length uh, carbon skeletons, trioses, again OSE, representing that sugar, <laughs> carbons there. Tetros. Pentos, hexos, so you can just go right down the line, tetra, tetro in this case means four, pento, pentagon is five-sided, hexo, hexagon is six-sided. So already just in the last like three minutes here, I've given increasing level of diversity here. We can build and name more and more types of saccharides. Another component of structural diversity for saccharides comes with the middle carbon spatial arrangement. So this is a further step, further step in producing more diversity. So let me give you an example. I got two hexose molecules here, glucose. And galactose. At that middle carbon, so Glucose is here, galactose is here. So our middle carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, middle carbon is going to be here. So those middle carbons, if you look to the top and the bottom of the molecule, They're the same, but now if you look left and right on the molecule, they're switched. So right here, and right here, H, OH, whereas over here on OH and H. But if you look above, that is identical to this right here. And if you look below that middle carbon, that all, the way, all of this is identical to all of this. Then we look at that middle carbon left and right, and the H, H's are on different sides, hydrogens are on different sides, and hydroxyl groups are on opposite sides. So there's that kind of left, um, right switch. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, right? But when we have that switch like that, when we 
create our spatial arrangement differently, we end up with, in a lot of cases, some very distinct biological behavior. Again, glucose can be used as the starting product of the glycolytic path, leading towards ATP production. Galactose cannot be can't be used in that glycolytic pathway. Now everything up here makes these molecules look like they're in a linear structure, the projection that's used there. In all reality, it makes it a little bit harder to model because this is outside of an aqueous solution and we see this type of structure. In aqueous solution, we actually see the ring-like structures. We've already seen a couple examples there of ring-like structures. So we get this ring-like structure where it forms a carbon ring rather than the, the, the chain-like skeleton. Is it a ring only? Yeah, when we put it in that aqueous solution, it forms up that ring-like structure. So we're not really going to find these linear molecules in, in biology. You can project them that way and you can detail molecular structure and formula and things like that, but within a system like a biological system, you get that ring-like structure. Okay, so a very diverse molecule. We could actually add up a whole bunch more biologically relevant saccharides than what are shown here. Based off of all of these physical characteristics that are just like given. Those physical characteristics lead towards their physiological or biological function, or false function, that is one of our major biological themes. The functions that we have for sugars because of their shape, is they're really good at supplying energy. The sugars can act as ingredients and produce isaccharides, polysaccharides. So using our individual monomers of glucose and fructose can form a disaccharide called sucrose, lactose and glucose can form this thing called lactose, and then glucose and glucose this thing called maltose. So the individual sugars, their function is to add act as energy supplies and then as individual ingredients to produce additional molecules that will have additional function. A lot of people can start <coughs> functions. So for being an ingredient, an individual monomer, when it produces disaccharides, it connects them up through a dehydration synthesis reaction to create a covalent linkage. Specifically, that covalent linkage in the world of saccharides is going to be called a glycosidic linkage. So maltose, when we take our two glucose molecules and we put them together through that dehydration synthesis reaction, we're creating this covalent linkage or covalent bond between two individual macromolecules called a glycosidic linkage. Okay, so sugars uh, function as energy sources as ingredients and also as storage molecules. And really the storage is going to be the, the polymer side of things, the polysaccharides. Polymers of monosaccharides. Uh, and they can store 
for energy utilization, such as glycogen that we would find in the liver and the skeletal muscle of mammals. We can pull the glucose molecules out of storage as glycogen to feed into provisional cycles, such as the glycolytic pathway and the Krebs cycle. But the storage monosaccharides or monosaccharides acting as storage can also help to build other structures. So they can act as building blocks for <coughs> cellular structure. So in fact, we are going to find some molecules that act in storage and some molecules of sugar that are structurally important as well. In fact, I'll give you a hint. Cellulose, OSD, you know it's a sugar, it's going to be a polymer. That becomes a very important building point for the cell wall that we find are associated with plant cells. So the cell wall is not a lipid membrane like the cell membrane is, but rather a rigid sugar-like structure around a plant cell. And then the membrane of that plant cell is formed on the inside of that structure. So one of the important polysaccharides that shows up in terms of building, oh man, I'm almost out of time, is a building block into create these structured molecules. Um, one of the one of the, the big ones is, is what you would call starch. And starch is a storage for plants. So through photosynthesis, we begin to generate glucose, and that glucose needs to be put together into starch that gets stored within the plant. Um, sometimes in a leaf, sometimes in a growth such as potato. And then humans, we can actually consume that food to gain the starch. And we're eating the starch, which is a chain of glucose, which is what you can see here. Okay? So we have this chain of glucose molecules. One form of starch has a 1,4 linkage. And that means that, so the linkage, right, this is referencing the covalent linkage. What do we call the covalent linkage? We call it a glycosidic linkage, specifically for carbohydrates. This one is a 1,4 linkage. And what that means is that the link between the individual monomers is between one molecule's first carbon and the other molecule's fourth carbon. Okay, so carbon one and carbon four of the two different glucose molecules for building starch are bound together. Okay, here's carbon one, two, three, four. So this carbon four binds up to this carbon one, this carbon four binds to this carbon one, etc. So it's a one four link link because carbon one and carbon four are associated. All right, it's 9.50. So the cliffhanger till Monday is that a 1-4 linkage is going to cause certain structures to form that are going to be a little bit different than, let's say, a 1-6 linkage.